Welcome. Happy to have you in the talk today. I want to talk about how state helps you to stay reactive. And probably as kind of the introduction or kind of what we want to do today, I think a lot of people also here are doing kind of microservices, small components, which have to interact and actually in, in order to do something useful. I call them microservices today, if you do different things or if you call them differently, um, call it as you want. Most of the things I'm talking about are, are actually the same. And if we're in this microservices world, and I do an example today with order fulfillment because it's a domain everybody can easily relate to. So if you wanna order something, um, you probably build it or you have to build that. You build a checkout microservice, which takes orders uh, that you probably have a payment microservice to collect money and the inventory to keep inventory and shipment to ship stuff to customers. If you assume to have these four microservices, probably you want them to be reactive. You want them to be event-driven. So event-driven architecture is also kind of a hype at the moment. So all of these microservices might emit events like, hey, somebody ordered something. Hey, somebody paid something. Hey, so we ship your order, that's great, right? And if you have all of these events flowing around, let's say on kind of an event bus, um, what it could easily do is uh, you could listen to all of these events and build a notification service as an example. And then you um, send out emails. And then you have basically encapsulated all the logic around notifications in that one service. You don't have to spread the logic of, like among all the other services. You don't have to think about sending emails in the payment microservice. So that's kind of where we are at the moment with the industry as well. So we have these microservices and we have event-driven um, communication. We have reactive services reacting to these events. So far, so good, right? And that seems to be a, a good architecture. You probably listened into a couple of talks earlier on this conference um, talking about reactive and the basically all the advantages it gets. The thing um, is what I'm seeing with customers and with the projects is that there, there are a couple of, um, yeah, let's say potential pitfalls, um, which you have to be aware of. And I want to talk about two basically today. The first is that uh, you can use these event notifications, these reactive services to build chains of event notifications that basically implement kind of business processes, kind of flows. And that's a problem I want to talk about. And the second thing, and that's kind of connected in a way is about long running behavior, about the state that you have to remember things um, in your services in order to really be reactive. And I wanna explain all of that why um, in this talk, but that's kind of um, the agenda we have for today. So let's talk about event chains. One of my favorite topics actually, because a couple of years back, um, I really thought about that for a long time and discussed that with a lot of customers. Um, but let's do the basics first. So um, let's say you have the microservice checkout and probably that emits the event like there was an order place. That's what we had on the slide early on. You could use that event and subscribe to it directly from the payment microservice saying, hey, if there was an order placed, I'm interested in that because then I have to collect the money, right? And then the payment was retrieved and inventory could listen to that and say, hey, okay, if the money was retrieved, I wanna collect stuff from stock and so on and so forth. So you could basically use these event subscriptions to implement the business process of order fulfillment, right? And I've seen that happening um, relatively often in a lot of scenarios because these event driven architectures are kind of, kind of a hype at the moment as well. The problem I have with these event chains is that um, you really lose sight of what's happening here. You can't see the business process anywhere. So you probably have to reason about like different microservices, different event subscription in order to understand what's really going on here. Or you have to observe the uh, system in like, yeah, in the wild when it's working in order to understand what's going on here. And I don't have a good feeling about that. The um, I was super happy when Martin Fowler, which is, Kind of a credible source, I would say, in our industry. He blocked about that as well. And he said, um, or he wrote, um, the danger is that it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with the event notification without realizing that you're losing sight of a larger scale flow and thus set yourself up for trouble in future years. And that's more or less exactly what I've seen in a couple of projects as well. Um, a nice way or a nice metaphor to put that. Um, is this one, and that's Phil Calzado at the QCon New York last year. 
and he talked about what they did at Meetup in their architecture. And that was also basically very event driven. And he said, okay, we were suffering from pinball machine architecture. And I think it's a very good, uh, it's capturing very well the problem of these um, yeah, purely event driven system. And I made my own slide on that. So um, you basically, you can throw in some kind of event, some kind of trigger, and then you get like dong, 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 a lot of events bouncing through the system. And I'm, I love doing that. So. Let's invest some time here. <laughs> it's very well invested. And um, yeah, and you can, I mean, you can recognize that in companies where people are, are basically puzzled by certain situations, like hey, how did that happen? We never implemented that case in our system. That our system can't do this. This cannot happen, right? That's what's called emergent behavior. It emerges during runtime and it's not always easy to control or to foresee what's happening here. And I see that as a big risk, actually, a very big risk. Um, and you can make good examples where you have very hands-on concrete problems based on that. So let's assume um, you want to change the sequence of tasks here. You want to, um, let's say you want to fetch the items from the warehouse before you retrieve the payment. You simply want to change the sequence. In order to do that on the um, on the left hand side, what you have to do is like inventory no longer listens to payment received but order place and payment payment probably don't longer listens to order place but goods fetch and shipment don't listen long any longer to goods fetch but payment received right. So um, you have to change or to adjust all the three microservices down there: payment, inventory, and shipment. And not only you have to change all of them, you also have to um, redeploy them and you have to coordinate that deployment. Because if you have orders circulating through your system, it's very important in inventory to know if they are already paid or not, right? That's kind of a versioning problem, which is probably um, not avoidable if you want to do changes. But now you have kind of a distributed versioning problem spreading amongst different microservices. And the important or yeah, the issue here is that um, this violates most of the microservice principles where you wanna, wanna have very decoupled components, where you wanna change things locally because now um, you have to change things in a coordinated fashion. I think that's a big problem. The, um, that's known as a choreography. If you have these event-driven systems purely like event-driven, these change are choreographies. And the metaphor you normally see in most talks if they talk about Choreographies is this like a dance, like a beautiful dance <laughs> where they know the rules, they know the behavior. You can add a dancer and it will be kind of beautiful, right? And it's not what I really observe in real life. It's kind of very often hard to manage. It's very chaotic. It's very hard to understand, right? And that's at least a risk you should be aware of. The most important thought here is um, you have to think about responsibility or probably also like, um, yeah, who is held accountable for certain requirements. So if you think of order, like companies, mail order companies or companies like Amazon or here in, in, in Europe, we're um, doing things for Salando. Um, these companies, order fulfillment is one of the core processes. And it's kind of a naive thinking, a weird thinking actually, to say, yeah, the, the, the main business process of order fulfillment emerges out of certain event uh, notifications. But you wanna have this responsibility somewhere. You wanna have somebody, a person being responsible for that. If order fulfillment takes too long, if orders are delayed, if orders are not shipped, if not pay, non-paid orders are shipped, um, you wanna have somebody being responsible for that. And that could be, I mean, in the microservice world, it means it must be an own microservice or if you're in DDD and on bounded context, it's an own domain. So you have order fulfillment here. And now an interesting thought is like, I mean, you can still have event-driven communication. You could still say order fulfillment reacts to, hey, there was a new order place. That's fine. Then the responsibility in a way is within the order fulfillment team that they pick up the right events. Check out is like, hey, somebody ordered. I don't care what happens, right? It's not their responsibility, it's order fulfillment. But now payment is a different matter because now order fulfillment wants that the payment is retrieved now, 
right? And it's there, it's the, uh, the responsibility of the order fulfillment team to make sure that this happens. And this must be a different communication. For me, that's command driven. So it's not an event, something happened is, hey, payment now, I wanna have money collected for me. It's, it's really, an, it's an order that payment has to do something. It's command, right? And both is important, right? And then it can control that, that business process that flow within the order fulfillment microservice in that case. Uh, one sentence of, around wording. So for me, choreography is about event-driven communication. So or these like, yeah, that's choreography. And whenever I have command-based communication, that's for me orchestration. There is a lot of misconceptions around orchestration, which I'm not going to resolve today. Um, but for example, a lot of people think of orchestration being something central. Like come back to that later. It is not. For me, orchestration is that, um, I mean, if you like the word better, you could also say coordination. So one component, one microservice in this case, order fulfillment is coordinating another, in this case, the payment microservice. That's it. Okay. It's not about technology. That's another misconception. People are normally thinking of, yeah, events, that's Kafka or probably, um, yeah, Kafka is what most people are currently thinking. Um, and commands is rest, right? And that's not true. You can put, a, a Kafka stores records that can be an event or a command in the payload. If you send a message, it could be a command or an event, right? Um, you can have rest feeds and like in order to receive events. So um, it's not about the technology at all. But, and that's an interesting um, part. We're moving towards the second part of the talk. It's like, but especially if you have distributed systems and we had a keynote today from um, Jonas, which talked a lot about the unreliability of distributed systems. Or if you use asynchronous communication where you have to wait, or I mean, collecting money can take a lot a long time actually if you wait for incoming wire transfers or whatever. So you might have to wait for things in order fulfillment. And that means this like orchestrating payment, for example, needs to be stateful. You need to wait for the result and you need to remember what you're waiting for. So let's talk about state, stateful um, or what I call long running behavior. And long running in the sense that it might take seconds, but it might also take minutes, hours, days, weeks, probably months or years, right? And that's long running behavior. And we need a solution to handle that in these kind of situations. Right, um, let's briefly make my own biases transparent. So of course I'm biased in, in, in some way or opinionated, let's say that way. And just to make it transparent, Bernd Rücker, um, Johnny already introduced me. I'm co-founder and chief technologist of Camunda. We're an open source process automation vendor. Um, I contributed to a couple of different yeah, workflow engines over the last 15 years. So I'm kind of, kind of a weirdo around workflow um, engines and product automation. I never did something else in my professional life. So I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about that, right? That's probably interesting to know. So that of course means I'm looking at problem through the lens of process automation, um, which I find totally interesting. You might have different opinions. I'm happy to discuss later on in the Q&A. I'm currently writing a book with O'Reilly, Practice Process Automation, always searching for reviewers, tech reviewers. So if you're interested, reach out to me. They're my uh, yeah, contact data, happy um, to discuss. So, and in my world, if I have something like a workflow engine, which I introduced in a second, I can do, I can do these stateful orchestrations using process automation. So for example, I can define process models where I say, okay, the first thing I do is I send a command to retrieve the payment, but then I wait, and this is a waiting for a message, waiting for an event, waiting for a response message. That depends a bit on what I do there exactly. But it means I wait for something to happen that the payment is received. And now, because I have a workflow engine in place, this is stateful, it can wait for days if I need to wait. I can escalate later on and so on and so forth. I think I have a slide on that in a second here. So that's the main thing what such a workflow engine can do. It keeps the state safe. So depending on the tool that might be a relational database or their tools using event logs, there, there are different technologies to keep the state safe. It's not your problem. You simply leverage the technology and then you can wait and it can escalate if something waits too long and so on and so forth. And then, and that's, 
I find that one of the most important thoughts here, and then you have these process models, which can be long running. And basically you define all the long running behavior you need, like waiting for, for messages. But all the other behavior, like how do I send a command? What's the technology I use? You simply leverage programming language as you would do um, in any other place. So this is an example using Spring Boot, um, in this case CB. Um, but you could use whatever technology you like, right? And then you just glue that code to the to the process model and say, okay, in this step, execute this code. And the the workflow engine is really just doing the long running behavior, the, the persistence, the escalation, and so on and so forth. And that's a super powerful combination. And if you have tools that are very lightweight, you can have this long running behavior available basically in every microservice. I'm coming back to that in a second. And if you do these orchestrations here, it's easy to see what's happening and it's easy to change if you wanna have it differently, like doing things in parallel, changing the sequence. Now it's really, it's one place where you can implement these um, requirements. So for me, this process automation technology solves a very hands-on developer problem around like long running things. And that can have technical reasons. So far, I would say what I, what I introduced were very technical reasons because I have distributed systems, I have messaging, I need to wait. That's a technical reason, if, even if I wait for, for days. But there are a lot of business reasons to wait as well in typical systems. So let's extend the example a bit. Let's say um, in order to collect the money, we also can charge credit cards, right? So we have these two microservices here. And let's say the credit card gets rejected for whatever reason, it's invalid, it's locked, it's, I don't know. It's simply got, gets rejected. Now the, the, the one obvious thing what it could do is like you could simply pass that problem on to the order fulfillment microservice saying, hey, the credit card couldn't be charged. We're out of luck with the payment. If you do this now, let's assume you get a requirement like, hmm, we have that relatively often and we actually want to send the customer an email and saying, hey, if the credit, your credit card was rejected, please update your, your payment details and then we will ship your order. If you do that within the next four hours, we're fine, right? That would be a much nicer behavior towards the customer. It probably saves a lot of orders you had to cancel otherwise and so on and so forth, right? Now, if you need to implement that um, requirement, you basically can, can ask the same question, who is responsible of doing that? And what I see very often is that this is now implemented somewhere, um, sorry, in the, in the order fulfillment microservice, just because, I don't know, because order fulfillment very often already has persistence because they can wait for these four hours and payment is kind of stateless. We don't want to bloat it with state. Let's uh, pass it on that problem. We don't want to solve it, but it's the same thing. You always have to ask who is responsible, who is held accountable for that. Um, requirement, who has to implement, what's a good architecture, where should I put that requirement? And for me, that's clearly the payment microservice here. The payment has to retrieve payment. And if it takes longer, four hours, a day, two days, I don't care, it should be in payment. And in order to do that, you need again, long running behavior, because now it gets at least potentially long running, because I have to wait for four hours. And my hypothesis is that a lot of products don't do that because it, it feels hard to do that, but you need to have that capability um, easily available. Like with a lightweight workflow engine, some of them you can even embed as a library. Um, if you're in the cloud, you can have a managed service. Um, if you're on Kubernetes, you might just have it as kind of a sidecar thing. So we, we, we start to have possibilities to have these workflow engines available very easily. And then you should, leverage that to have this long running behavior because it makes the whole architecture much more stable because now we can implement the requirement at the right place. And if you extend the payment example just a bit more, if you say, um, hey, I don't not only charge the credit card, but before I do that, I might look onto the customer account. Maybe he has credit topped up somewhere, vouchers or whatever that is. We deduct it from there. If it's not sufficient, we charge for the rest on the credit card, okay? Now you have an interesting problem. And that's, I, I find that one of the 
I would say the biggest problems we will see over the next years in the whole microservice um, architecture um, movement. Um, because now you talk to different remote services, they have transaction management locally. Like, hey, the customer credit service deducts a customer credit. That's an atomic transactional um, function. Like, hey, it's either deducted or not, right? And charging the credit card should be atomic in that sense as well. But you can't do a technical transaction spanning both. You can't say, hey, the charging of the credit card failed, so I have to roll back the deduction of the customer credit. It simply doesn't work. Um, there are a couple of yeah, attempts to solve distributed transactions, um, but none of them is really practical at the moment. If you're interested in that, ask me later on, send me an email. There, there, there are really good papers. On, on that. At the moment, I would assume you don't have distributed transactions, but you have to solve the problem here. And that's um, what's called in, in my world of the of process automation. And this, by the way, what I'm using here is so called BPMN. That's a, an ISO standardized notation to express these process models, which are executable on a workflow engine. And in BPMN, there's a construct called compensation. And compensation basically means, hey, if I can't charge the credit card, that's an arrow event here. If something happens, um, I yeah, compensate, I rewind. That's kind of the undo, I rewind. Uh, and I define for all of the activities I did early on, I define if I need to rewind them, I define the compensating activity. And these activities are executed by the workflow engine automatically, right? And that, that basically means I just like abort the transaction. I roll it back, but it's not a really a rollback. It's kind of an undo, it's a rewind. I might see that on my balance that they deducted credit and then put it back. Okay, cool. And that's also known as the saga pattern. So this saga, it's kind, there's a classical pattern from the eighties, which is about long lived transactions. Okay, that's why it's known as the saga pattern. It's a term you might have known, especially in the reactive world, or if you're with Akka, you probably know Sagas. Cool. Workflow engine can do that. So um, that's another thing um, where, yeah, and long running kicks in as well, because I mean, for example, um, if you can't restore the customer credit, that might be a REST API at the moment where you try to, you need to wait for it to become available, for example. So you, you have to wait again. So it gets long running relatively quickly. Bernd, there is a quick question. Uh, what if the rewind fails? Um, yeah, so what's the, if the rewind fails? There are a couple of options here. One is you either really um, implement it on that level. If that's kind of a common scenario for you, you probably even wanna, wanna model for it, right? Um, and the second possibility is if it doesn't work, you normally just stop trying and you, um, I mean, for us in our engine, it's called an incident. So you basically raise a problem in the operations tool or probably that's an alarming or you send an email or whatever you do then. And that means an operator looks into that, sees, hey, there's an instance failed. It's currently waiting here. That's the data, that's the context. And then he or she can repair it. That's kind of the idea. And that's the same Great, thing as you. like if the deduction failed. You normally then either you model it if it's kind of a normal case, if you wanna wanna have it like automatically um, solved or um, you leave it to an operator. Right, Great, because at you. some point in time, you have to stop modeling each and everything. Otherwise it gets a mess. Nice. Um, one interesting thing I like about um, the whole saga pattern is there is one example, which is really used everywhere. So if you Google for the saga pattern, you will find this example, like booking a trip. You might remember that from last year and book a hotel, book a rental car, book a flight. And if you, if you build a, a service that does that, you might need to leverage different other services, right? And the same thing, you can't roll back the whole thing. So in case of an error when booking the flight, you need to undo the assets and that probably needs to cancel them. You might even be charged money. It's not a rollback. It's really, it's an undo, it's a compensation. And that's a saga pattern. And what's really interesting there as well, if you follow the discussions, um, you end up with something I already had in the beginning with the, with the event flows, with the event chains. Um, the same discussion is going on here. Can, should I implement a saga by choreography or orchestration? So just 
walking through that very quickly because we already discussed that a little bit. So you could definitely use events for that. So, hey, somebody booked a trip. Um, okay, I need to book a hotel. The hotel is booked. I, the car rental service subscribes to it. I say, okay, then I need to book the rental. It's booked, the flight, and so on and so forth. That's an event chain. In case something goes wrong, you even have to do it in the reverse order. So you get kind of cyclic dependencies because the car rental um, also has to subscribe to flight booking failed, for example, and so on and so forth, performs the undo and so on and so forth. You get the same problems here. So it's, it's really hard to understand what's going on. It's even harder because it starts to get cyclic. And um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of really, I, I, I don't like that approach very much for these kind of things. Um, I like this blog post from Dennis. He's basically said, okay, um, this approach can rapidly become confusing. Right. So it might be okay for if you have two to four steps, but then it's too complex. Right? I kind of agree. And you can make the same example. If you want to change the sequence of things, hey, we want to book the rental car first. We have a new contract. We can cancel for free. So let's do that first. You have to adjust all the services. That's homework to think through that chain, okay? All of that. If you do orchestration, you would have the orchestration logic in the trip service, probably commanding others. Hey, book the hotel for me now. Yeah, book, okay, book the car for me now. Okay, book, the, book the flight, right? And now you have that one place where you can understand the logic, where you can change it, where you can have the compensation and so on and so forth. Right. Cool. And you could, uh, of course, use leverage process automation for that, leverage the compensation um, capabilities of BPMN, for example. Nice. Okay. If you want to see some code examples, and that might be the last thing we um, do here today, I'm not going into that. I mean, I have one and a half minutes left, so. <laughs> but I just wanted to give you the pointer. So exactly the example I showed you now is um, available on GitHub. If you're fancy, some, some Java code, you can read through it. How, how does that work in Java? How does an operation tool look like? And probably just play around with it yourself if you're a more C-sharp person. I have the same thing also like in C-sharp can also play around with that. Um, if you're more a serverless person, I have that on AWS and um, so AWS functions and lambdas and GCP Google functions, um, where you can also play around with that. So there are a couple of things available for, for doing that. The last important thought here is for me, all of that domain logic, like here, the trip booking um, orchestration or earlier on the order fulfillment, for me, that's domain logic. It's part of the service. And that's the main difference to what most people um, hear when they hear orchestration, where they think of a centralized whatever BPM platform thingy. No, it's domain logic. It's part of that microservice. You probably have other microservices that also have workflow logic. They have their lo workflow logic. I don't see it from the outside. It's an API. I call the payment service or call the trip service. Nice. Um, Let's do a quick, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, let's do a quick recap. So from my perspective, you need long running capabilities. That's very important for a lot of reasons. It makes your whole architecture more robust. Your microservice is better. Um, workflow engines are really undervalued in that field. Um, they're, they're very late, lightweight, developer-friendly ones. I mean, I'm biased, of course, but I really believe that. Uh, and then you need to balance orchestration and choreography. So event-driven, reactive things with coordinating. Um, commanding things. Um, if you want to learn more, I'm writing that book I said earlier on. Um, thank you very much.